While you're taking your Bibles and turning to the book of the Revelation, chapter 14, let me uh, again encourage you to uh, be here on Sunday mornings as we're continuing our series on being free. And uh, Sunday night, I want to share with you in advance, uh, seems like the Lord has directed my mind and my heart to deal with this. And I'll give you this uh, little advance notice in light of what has happened uh, in our world this week and hear of actors that uh, uh, passing away untimely. It seems like the Lord has just uh, caused my spirit to uh, look at and deal with Sunday night what the Bible says about suicide. You know, it's really a question probably that hits so many of us and uh, it's a question that really we need biblical answers to. You know, it's amazing how quickly we can say things off the cuff. But we need to hear what God has to say through the pages of His Word. And so I uh, want to encourage you. Maybe you just have a friend who you want to invite, but it seems like that's the direction that the Lord is leading my spirit. That will be Sunday night. Uh, what does God have to say? What does the Bible say about suicide? And so uh, I know our world has been stunned this, uh, this week with uh, probably one of the one of the most uh, profound uh, actors on the, on the screen, and Robin Williams, and seemed like he had everything going uh, for him. But uh, that's always not the case. So uh, keep that in mind. Well, let me invite you again to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of the Revelation, chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Now, if you're uh, getting back in with us, or maybe this is your... Uh, first time with us on Wednesday night. We're walking through and taking a tour through the Revelation. And uh, we're already to chapter 14. And as we've been walking through Revelation, you remember, and of course I'll not take time to go through the entire book, but you remember that Revelation is a book that is chronologically laid out. In other words, they are events that in the very first chapter, the Bible says the things that were, the things that are, and the things that are to come. In other words, God by His Spirit gives to the Apostle Paul those visions, those pictures, those scenes of end time events. Just as God started this world in the creation story, you know, God is going to end this world. And when you get to the Revelation, you get to the end of uh, the Bible, but you will also come and we're also looking at the end of the age, the end of the world, the end of time. And uh, again, let me just remind you that in the early chapters, God gives a glorified picture of Christ. You remember uh, John says he sees him and he falls at his feet as dead. And who is it? It's, it's the Lamb of God. You know, John is seeing Christ for who he is. You and I will have to be changed so we can see Christ for who he is. Well, you remember after you get to chapters 1, 2, and 3, we're looking at uh, what God has to say to the churches. Now, when you come to Revelation 2 and 3, you have God's message to the seven churches. They are seven real churches, but they're also seven historical churches. That is, they picture the panorama of history, what will take place and what the churches will be like up to the end of time. And uh, someone has wisely said that uh, when you look at Laodicea, Laodicea is the last church. It is the, it is the uh, lukewarm church. And it reveals an apostate church, a church that really is not, but it looks and it pretends as though it is. Now, when you come to chapters 4 and 5, you remember John is ushered up into heaven. He is given a picture of things that are in heaven. He is, he is taken up. And he sees 24 elders. What are the 24 elders? The representative of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Levitical system, I don't have time to go into it, but in the Levitical system, 12 was very symbolic of a whole. And uh, the 24 is symbolic of the church. Now, you remember when you come to Revelation chapter 6 through 11, what we looked at, you saw really the unleashing of the judgments of God. And by the way, let me say this as you read the Revelation. Read it as it is. Now, I have been a student of Scripture for many years, and I have heard many people say, well, now you just can't take that as it is because it's so symbolic and it doesn't mean this, it means the other. 
Well, you have a problem with that if you follow that all the way through. Number one, if everything has a symbol, who has the keys to unlock the symbols? And what person or persons or group of persons? And another reality too is whenever God speaks, He is very clear. Now, some of the language is symbolic, but it carries with it very serious and very significant meanings when you, when the Spirit of God unveils it. So you remember in chapter 6 through 11, you have the judgments that are taking place. We have the picture of, of the seal judgments. And let me remind you, the seal judgments take place over the seven year period of tribulation. Now, after chapter 3 of Revelation, the church is gone. Uh, the church is raptured. The church is harpazio. Harpazio literally means catching away. It's a picture in Paul's letter. It's a picture in the book of Acts. How do you know that the church is going to be harpazio, is going to be caught away? Well, God makes it very clear. You can look in, uh, in Romans. As a matter of fact, uh, God makes it clear in Romans that we're not appointed unto wrath. He also makes it clear in Revelation. And uh, the, the uh, seal judgments are the seven-year span of time, and the trumpet judgments come later. And when you get to Revelation 12 and 13, and we've already been into that, we've looked at the Antichrist. The Antichrist that is literally going to be on the earth's scene. Is he going to be a real person? Yes, he is. How do you know he's a real person? Because when you look in the end of uh, Revelation, you'll find that God takes the Antichrist and the false prophet and casts them, into, uh, casts them alive into the lake of fire. You don't cast ideologies, you don't cast governments, you cast people. And so God makes it very clear that there is going to come on the world stage an Antichrist. As a matter of fact, uh, we're hearing more and more and more about the European common market, the G7, the G11, all the different governmental systems. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, in Daniel, when you go back to Daniel chapter 7, 8, 9, 11, and 12... Uh, Daniel speaks of futuristic events. Why? Because keep in mind, as you look at Revelation, this is God's book. He started this world. He began this world. Did you find out how it began? And by the way, this world did not uh, evolve. Uh, this world was created because the Bible says, God says, in the beginning. You see, you can't have it two ways. You cannot have evolution and creation. It is either or. It cannot be both. Why? Because there's one simple rule in the world. The law of non-contradiction says two things cannot be equally true and equally false at the same time. So in Revelation chapter 14, you remember uh, in verses 1 that uh, John is seeing a scene. And what is the scene? Well, let me just give you... A, this is fast-forwarding into the future. And what we really are doing, we're looking at future events. But what John sees in Revelation 14, he sees a picture of the 144,000. Now, let me just remind you uh, that the 144,000 appear back in Revelation chapter 7. Who are the 144,000? I I can remember as a boy, people would ask different questions, and they were honest questions, they just didn't know. Is 144,000 all that's going to be saved? No. No. Uh, who are the 144,000? It tells you specifically in the Bible. They are 12,000 out of the tribes of, uh, of Israel. 12,000 out of each tribe. They will be the greatest evangelist. They will be the greatest preachers during the Great Tribulation. You remember the Great Tribulation is the wrath of God upon the world, upon unrighteousness. And uh, since we're going to be translated before the Great Tribulation, uh, the question is raised then, Uh, will there be people saved in the Great Tribulation? And the answer is absolutely yes. You say, well, how do you know that? Take your Bible and turn back to Revelation chapter 7 for a moment. Revelation chapter 7. Because when you are are looking at Revelation 14, you know, one thing is is clear that uh, uh, there are are some that have died. When you look at Revelation 7, rather, there are some that have died. Revelation 7.14 says, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What in the world is John saying? That is a glorious and symbolic way of saying those 
These are those, in Revelation 7, 14, that have died. They've washed their robes. In other words, they've stood for the blood of the Lamb. They've stood for the Lord Jesus Christ. They have not bowed their convictions. They are men and women of God who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the great tribulation, though it meant their life, they would not recant. They would not bow down. They wouldn't bow to the Antichrist. You remember, he will walk into Jerusalem and the Bible says that there will be a certain time that he'll break his pact with Israel. He will sit down uh, on, the, on the seat in the temple and he will announce to the world, probably by means of television, by means of whatever is a present then, technology will be so probably advanced, but he will announce to the world that he is the Lord God. By the way, did you see on Facebook the man who declared himself to be the Son of God this past week or a couple of weeks ago? Uh, I saw it. I didn't believe what I was seeing. But he announced to the world, he announced to all that was listening, he is the Son of God. And uh, he was interviewed by someone, I think it was from CBS, but uh, he made it very clear to that interviewer that he is the Son of God, that God's Spirit came into him and he is the Son of God. And uh, she was asking him about different things. And, of course, he said... uh, when we preach the gospel, that that's not really true. Sin's not a big deal anymore. A lot of things he throws out of the Bible. One thing he doesn't throw out of the Bible, though, he doesn't throw the collection plate out. He doesn't throw the collection. Uh, as a matter of fact, he even said, well, I let people give if they want to give. Now, do you remember what Jesus said himself? Many will say in that day, I am Christ, I am the Messiah, I am the Son of God. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ warns you and me of. And so whenever you come to Revelation 14, you come to a glorious scene. Let me give you a little bit of the backdrop of where this is. You remember in Acts chapter 1, in verses 8 through 11, the the angels were present on the mount as Jesus was getting ready to go back up into heaven. And you remember what the angels said, You men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing? For this same Jesus that you have seen go up into heaven will what? So come in like manner as you have seen him go away. Well, when you come to Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, guess what? The Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the the one that we've been talking about, preaching about, he has come back to Mount Zion. Isn't that awesome? Amen. He has come back. So let's look in verses 1 through 5 and follow along in your outline as we look tonight. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders and... No man could learn that song, watch this, but the hundred and forty-four and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault, before the throne of God. Now, remember, this is a scene that John is being given by God. He is seeing things that are to come. In other words, he is seeing that second coming of Christ. He is seeing Mount Zion before it will actually happen. John is being given that wonderful adventure of seeing. And what he is, what's he seeing? Well, keep in mind, back in Revelation chapter 6... John is being told about the wrath that is getting ready to come on the world. God makes it very clear, and, and there's a point of respite, because, you know, John hears about the, the devastation, destruction, and death, and all that. And imagine taking all that in. He has to have a rest. And in the middle of all of that, John says, Who can stand against all of that? Who can stand against the wrath of God? Who can stand against everything that's going to take place? Well, when you get to Revelation chapter 7, God says, I'll tell you who can stand. I will have 144,000 that are sealed from the line of Israel. Not 139,300, but 144,000. Why is it 144,000? It's real simple. 
Look at each tribe and how many are sealed. 12,000 out of each tribe. And so in chapter 6, when, as I said, when the question's asked, you know, God announces that there's 144,000. And he tells him that there's going to be these 144,000. They're going to be sealed. Now, what are these 144,000 doing through the Great Tribulation? Now, remember... They are sealed by God in the Great Tribulation. The world is blowing up all around them. So many things are happening. The Antichrist, the false prophet, all sorts of things are happening all over the world stage. But these 144,000 are the evangelists during the Great Tribulation. They are the preachers. They are the proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Great Tribulation. They're probably the ones that are responsible for the mass number coming to Christ. These are the greatest mission, enterprise, devoted men of God the world stage will have ever known. They are 144,000 Daniels, so to speak. There are 144,000 Josephs or Apostle Pauls. There is a zeal, there is a passion, there is an unction about these 144,000, and they are sealed by God's Spirit. And uh, you remember, uh, you know, God said that He has sealed them. What does that mean? Well, seal has a number of, of applications. But the seal means they are, they are, they are protected. You know, whenever you seal something, you protect it. You protect it from the outside elements. And you stop and think about it for a moment. If you're a child of God, there is a seal on the inside of you. Is there not? You say, well, I don't know if there is. Well, yes, there is. The Bible says the seal is the Holy Spirit of God. Why is it that you don't want to do what the world does? Because you're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. There is that desire on the in- You're here tonight because you want to be here. Nobody held a gun to your head or nobody made you come. You're here because you want to be here. You want to learn about your Father. You want to learn about the Son, the Holy Spirit. You want to learn what God has in store. And so these 144,000 witnesses will be those who literally survive the Great Tribulation. Now, some may have the question, well, I don't know if these do survive. Well, the reality is they're sealed. They are protected. They're protected from death. There is an invincibility about these witnesses. They are not going to die. And by the sovereign hand of God, they can't die. There is nothing on the face of the earth that will be able to kill them. Why? Because they are absolutely protected and sealed by God. As uh, Dr. John MacArthur declared, they are the greatest preaching force the the world has ever known. And uh, so... Uh, as I, as you remember last week, we looked at the identity of these saints and the seal. Now, uh, tonight I want you to get your outline out, follow along, but I want you to look at the fact that they're invincible. Now, when you read the working of the Antichrist that is on the world stage, in, back in Revelation 13, it looks as if nobody can survive the Antichrist. You remember everybody on the face of the earth bows down to the Antichrist. Everybody pays homage to the Antichrist. And yet the Bible makes it clear, that, as I said, there is coming a force beyond any type of devotion that you and I can comprehend. These 144,000, they are, they are a militia mighty for God. In other words, there is nothing that can get them to turn away. There is nothing that gets them to recant. There is absolutely nothing under God's heaven that will get them to turn away from the living God. They have a zeal inside of them because it is placed there by God. And so uh, uh, 144,000 saints, they're preserved. They're preserved from the Jewish line. And uh, they're, they're men, you know, every one of us like to, uh, like winners. We don't like losers. Uh, as you heard me share last week, you know, if there's a loser on your basketball team, you, if, you, if your coach is a loser, fire him. If your politician is a loser, vote him out. Why? Because there's something on the inside of us. We don't like losing. We don't like losers. Well, these Christians, these saints of God are, are an invincible force. They are 144,000 strong. And by the way, let me tell you this. We have 50,000 missionaries, according to statistics all over the world, not in our denomination, but, but all denominations, 
This is a force almost three times as strong in mission force when it comes to uh, the preaching of the Word. And so they're going to be preaching. And uh, in verse 1, the Bible says they're standing in, in victory. They're standing before the Lamb. And uh, because here's what they've done. Think about it. They have gone through all hell. They have gone through hell on earth. They have witnessed what the Antichrist has done. They have witnessed what the false prophet has done. And they have walked through the seven years of tribulation when this earth is literally rocking. And they have walked through the seven years and they come out victorious and they see the Lord Jesus Christ come back and they gather at Mount Zion. How do you know they're Jews? Because that's where they're located. Now, let me give you an interesting fact. If the rapture took place today, if the rapture took place tonight, This event would happen seven years from today. How do you know? Because prophecy is very specific. Prophecy is not possibly, maybe, maybe it will work out here. Do you realize prophecy is very specific? Where was Jesus Christ born? What city? Where was he born? In Bethlehem. Where does the Bible say in in, uh, Micah that Jesus would be born? Which uh, was written five to seven hundred years before the birth of Christ. Where does it say he was going to be born? Bethlehem, Ephrata. And isn't it interesting that God had to bring Joseph and Mary out of a different place and bring them to Bethlehem so it could fulfill prophecy? Why do I say that? Because I just want to give you one example, one taste, how specific prophecy is. So if the rapture takes place today, and by the way, let me tell you this. Again, let me remind you. There is nothing biblically that has to take place for the rapture to come. The rapture could come tonight, tomorrow, next week. There is nothing that has to happen. There is no prophecy that has to be fulfilled. There are many prophecies before the second coming of Christ, none before the rapture. And so, first of all, the fact is that these saints are invincible. The Bible says, and uh, I saw 144,000. Now, one of the things that's uh, interesting, the second point I want you to notice, look at the fact that these saints are kept by the power of God. One of the things that we overlook and we forget is the keeping power of God. Uh, I want you to look at verse 1 again. I want you to look in your outline. I want you to look in your scripture. And I beheld, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. In other words, you can look back at chapter 7, 144,000. Revelation chapter 14, 144,000. How many of the 144,000 has the Lord Jesus lost? None. Do you remember what Jesus said about you and me? He said, I've, I've lost none that you've given into my hand. My Father is greater than me and they're in His hand. In other words, all that belong to God, God keeps. Don't that give you a little bit of comfort in a, in a wicked, wild, depraved, and ungodly world? There's not a single person that's going to be lost that belongs to God. God don't lose any out of His grip. And uh, these saints, the Bible says, they're kept by the power of God. And the Bible makes it clear that, uh, you know, God has placed in their forehead His name. And it's a, and it's a sobering reminder of the, of the keeping power of God. You need to be mindful, and I do too. We need to be mindful that our Lord makes it clear. All who place their faith in me, I have lost none, what our Lord says. In other words, you're not going to be lost. If you're a child of God, there's nothing you can do to, uh, to lose your protection, to lose your salvation. Uh, The Bible says they're sealed. How are they sealed? They're sealed by the power of God. Let me give you an example. All the way back in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, the Bible says Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah's righteous life was his protection. And in his righteousness, God put him into an ark and sealed him. In other words, he couldn't die, he couldn't He couldn't be lost, he couldn't be killed, the rain couldn't get him. Why? Because he was protected. Well, in a very, very real sense, the God who promised to seal them is also a God that keeps them. Uh, In your Bible, turn back to the book of Jude. Book of Jude, I want you to look in verse 24. Now, Jude only has one chapter, that's why I didn't give you... Turn to Jude chapter 3. No, there's no Jude chapter 3. Uh... Uh, there's only one chapter. And uh, I want you to look at verse 24. Now unto him who is able to... 
Say that next word with me. Keep. Keep you from falling. Look at what it says. To keep you from falling. To present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. And again, even Jesus Himself declared that the Father has given to Him and and there's not been a one that's lost. So what Jesus is saying here, here's 144,000 saints. These have weathered the greatest tribulation this earth has ever known. They have come through the end of it. Not one of them the Antichrist has killed. Not one of them the false prophet has destroyed. Not one of them the demons that are on the hell, on, on the earth has done away with. Why? Because they are sealed. Do you realize that you are so protected by God? You know, sometimes we say about ourselves, you know, I, I, I'm so scared to death. Do you realize that you are protected? And not only are you, do you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, but the Bible says the angel of the Lord camps around those who fear him to deliver them from what? Evil or harm. In other words, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the angel of God around you. And so when God sealed these 144,000, they're sealed by the power of God. What, that, what does that mean? Hell can't get them. And hell can't get you. Think about it for a moment. I've done this a few other times, and I want to do it tonight again. We always want to give Satan such big do, much bigger than what he deserves. The Bible says he is, a, he is an angel, he is a fallen angel, and we want to think that he can do anything to us that he wants to at any given time because he is so bigger and powerful. Well, I want you to listen to me real carefully. Now, I'm not saying this to tempt anybody. But I'm just going to say you how, tell you how Satan... If Satan is so big and so powerful, let him kill me right now. Hello? Am I still talking? Or are you in heaven? <laughs> now, why did I say that and why did I do that? Because the Bible says the devil is a what? Liar. And he's the father of lies. In other words, he lies to you, he lies to me, I'll do anything. Listen, the Bible says we're in the hands of God and these that are sealed by the power of God, they know the sealing power of God. They know the power of God. They have walked through hell on earth for seven long years. Folks, this is not some symbolic seven years. This is seven actual years before the Lord Jesus Christ comes, at the end of the seven years, comes to Mount Zion. These 144,000 sealed Jews have walked through the hells on earth and they have found themselves sealed by God and they have come through the end of the great tribulation and they're standing and they realize it's over. The tribulation is over and now they see the Messiah and, and He's there. He's at the Mount of Zion just like he said he would be. Can I tell you that in the study of Revelation and as I listen and read things, I'm getting more and more convinced we're close even at the end of the door, so to speak. Do you realize how many supermoons we've had recently? Some call them blood moons. Do you realize that one of the earliest blood moons didn't take place till 1600s. And the next blood moon, I don't believe, took place till 1849. And we are going to have four super moons in two years' time. What's significant about that? Because Scripture talks about the red moon, the blood moon. And why are so many preachers preaching on Revelation? was looking the other day. Dr. Charles Stanley was doing a series on the rapture. Pastor over at uh, uh, Elk Springs Valley, where my daughter goes to church, uh, is doing a, a series on Revelation. Why are so many in the church, why are so many pastors preaching and teaching on the Revelation? The answer is found in Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Turn back to the book of Amos. Let me show you something. Amos chapter 3. Amos chapter 3. Have you got it? Amos chapter 3, and I want you to listen carefully. Sobering verse. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He revealeth His secret unto His servants, 
the prophets. Do you think the Lord is trying to let His church in on the secret things He's getting ready to do? Such as the coming rapture. Such as what's getting ready to take place. Why, that's why we're studying. That's why we're in the revelation. So, second of all, you see the fact that these saints are, are kept by the power of God. But then I want you to notice something else in Revelation chapter 14. I want you to look in your copy of the Scripture and notice something. These two witnesses, not only are they sealed by the power of God, but uh, the Bible makes it very clear that they're protected by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you come to verse 2, it says, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and I heard the voice of great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with, with their harps. Now, I want to confess to you at the very outset, some of Revelation is difficult. You would agree to that, amen? Some of it is difficult. But keep in mind, it's, it's, it, in some ways it's simple if you think about it. We started off with eternity, and then God created time. Correct? Not if you're with me. The Bible says, in the beginning, God what? Created. So, before the beginning, there was God and there was eternity. And now we're in this span that we call time. Once this world is done and wrapped up, guess what we're going to go back to? We're going to go back to eternity, yes. You get it? God said, I'm going to create time. You see, in the beginning, time, God, power, created, matter. So you have time, matter, and power. And so, you know, when you come to verse 2, there's another characteristic. The Bible says they're marked with praise and worship for the Lord God. And here's what, they're, they're at Mount Zion. Get the picture, though. The, it's over. It's over. It's over. No more warring anymore. No more fighting anymore. No more bloodshed anymore. Do you get the picture? Isaiah said it real clear. And we're going to talk about the millennium, what it's going to be like. The lion is going to lay down with the lamb. And the child is going to play on the hole of the asp. Now some people are trying that too quick. I see some pictures on Facebook where some kids now have uh, snakes around them. That time's not yet. Don't put a snake around your neck. And, and in Revelation it says, you know, they've gone through the hostility. They've gone through the hatred. And they're with the King of Kings. And they're with the Lord of Lords. It's over. Let me try to just give you a small, small type of example. My brother was in Thailand, was in Vietnam, next to Vietnam, back in 1967, 68. And it was the most horrible Christmas Eve I guess I've ever spent in my lifetime. As we took him to the airport and we watched him go off to, you know, we didn't know where and only God knew where. And probably nobody said a word coming back. It sounded just like that. My mother prayed for him daily, prayed God's protection over him. I never my mom, saw my mom get beside herself too many times, okay? My mom was a very dignified lady, very, very mild, meek. But when she saw that silver American airline coming from California to land at McGee Tyson Airport, carrying my brother, from Thailand because it was over. His tour of duty was over. He would no longer serve overseas. It was over. She got beside herself. That was the days you could run out onto the tarmac. They'd put the chair, they'd put the, the uh, stairs, not the chairs, take a lot, put the stairs up. And uh, he came down and, and uh, he was awfully good to see. And here's what we knew. In our heart, we knew it was over. He wouldn't ever be stationed overseas anymore. And pretty soon the war would, the war would be coming again. But I want you to hear, get this. These 144,000 have gone through the most difficult, hellish time in the world. And the Bible says they see the Messiah come at Mount Zion. And they gather around him because they know that the second coming has taken place. And you see, that's, that's the picture. 
And uh, they praise God. You know, they, they glorify God. They exalt God. And, uh, you know, what's taking place? Well, when you look at it, it says heavenly voices. In other words, not only are they praising God, but here's what's happening. Heaven is rejoicing. Why is heaven rejoicing? Because redemption and God's plan for the ages has come to fruition. Now, where are you and I in all this? Well, we're already in heaven. Remember, we've been raptured. So, you know, so somebody may ask, well, what am I going to do at the second coming? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be in glory. You know, I'm going to be with the Lord. I'm going to be at the rapture. I'm going to be at that marriage supper of the Lamb. And so, you know, they've gone through hostility. And look at, uh, look at number four and look at your outline. There is a new song that is given to them to sing. I want you to notice it. And the Bible says, uh, And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. Now the beasts should be creatures. And the elders, and no man could learn the song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Now, why in the world is that the case? Remember who these 144,000 are. The world has given in to the Antichrist. The world has given in to the false prophet. The world has given in. And by the way, the world is, is going to where it has been. Let me give you an example. One of the things that was very predominant back in the Old Testament was sensuality and sexuality coupled with religion. We've got a world of sensuality and sexuality, and I'm sure that the Antichrist will promote that to no end. There will be no holes barred. Listen, you think we live in a loose world. It'll be, a, it'll be unreal what the world will be like when the Antichrist rules because the world will love him, and he'll cater to every fleshly appetite and craving of the human body. And uh, the Bible makes it very clear. And so, you know, they, they are given a new song. And it's interesting that nobody was given the privilege on earth to sing that song but this 144,000. They've been redeemed. They've been redeemed out of tribulation. They've been redeemed out of all the hells. And, and literally all of heaven is worshiping and praising and overflowing with praise. Heaven's rejoicing over the fact that the redemption work of God is done. Now, remember this. The earth scene isn't over. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Jesus Christ has come back to earth and, and it's all over and heaven starts. Well, it does in some sense, but you forget one thing, the millennial reign of Christ. And so uh, the tribulation saints are, are singing a new song. They, and we're in heaven. And I'm going to be honest with you at this point. This particular portion of Revelation gets pretty challenging. Do you ever get to Revelation and say, I just can't understand that, and you just close it up? Well, don't do that. But really and truly what is happening, you're looking at the tribulation saints and these 144,000. And then lastly, look at the purity. These saints are, are found without fault and guile. Now, you need to keep in mind, the Antichrist has been running amok on the world stage. He has been having his heyday. People have been bowing to him right and left. But these 144,000, the Bible says they're virgins. They're pure. In a world so fixed with sensuality, they are found pure and spotless before God. What a testimony to the keeping power of God and to their faithfulness to the Lord. And... Uh, these 144,000, the Bible says, are found without guile, and, are, and they're pure. And by the way, when John talks about them, he, 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 he announces it loudly. Without guile, pure, virgin. And here's why. Because those are things that are big to God. Don't you think that things that are big to God ought to be big to you and me? Being pure being holy, walking right before Him. You see, the world has changed the price tags. You know, the world says purity is, is not important. Do you realize the only thing that's going to save you from death and disaster is the shed blood of Christ and righteousness? Like that song says, My hope is built on nothing less than what? 
Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. And you see, in the midst of a world that will have no morals, do you see what is happening in our world stage? And by the way, let me tell you, it's not accidental. We are becoming more amoral. You know what amoral is. Not, it's not bad morals. It's just no morals. Mike, whatever you want to do, you can do. Mona, whatever you want to do. Now, if it's right for Mike, but it may not be right, wrong for you, though. That's where we are. In the book of Judges, the Bible says, and the people did what was right in their own eyes. You see, we're coming to the stage that's going to be set for the end of Christ. It's getting set. It is being set, even as I speak. There is going to be a one-world government. We are moving closer to the one-world government. There is going to be ten, and out of that ten, there's going to be one that's going to rise, just like Germany. One who is a private, seemingly a nobody, because Germany was bankrupt and the businesses were closing down week after week. And they needed somebody to rescue them. It didn't matter who it was, but somebody with a soft-spoken voice, very short, not very tall at all. He would speak with a whisper at first, and then he would draw you in. That's what's coming. Somebody that has the charisma, but will have far greater charisma than he did, and he'll rule the world. But guess what? He'll only rule for a certain period of time. And during that time frame, there is going to be people come to faith in Christ. They're going to be saved, and then they're going to be killed. But these 144,000, they're going to walk through the seven years. And then after the seven years, there's going to be the rule of Christ on this earth. Now, time has run out, at least for tonight. But some will say, why does Jesus want to rule on this earth? Number one, he has a right to rule. Number two, this world is his. And wouldn't you like to know what this world is like with complete peace? Imagine your neighbor loving you. Imagine your neighbor beside you. Now just imagine for a moment. That person you knock on their door, all they want to do is help you and be kind to you and love you and care for you. You knock on the next door and all that person wants to do is be kind. You knock on children... Oh, you see children playing, and, and they love one another. And you see animals, and animals aren't hurting, or they're not vicious, they're not biting, they're not snapping. They're, they're, what's a world going to be like? Well, it's coming. And we're going to get to see it. And some of you have assignments. You've all got assignments. Some of you, in the millennial reign of Christ, you have a responsibility of five cities. That's what God has said in His Word. That's not symbolic, folks. That is five actual, literal cities. Some of you are over ten cities. I told Charlotte, I said, she's over the nursery. And uh, some of you are over something. But listen to what Jesus said in the last chapter. My reward is with me to give to every man. Don't you know that these saints of God, this 144,000, they were... They were praising God, they were worshiping God, they were singing to the glory of God because it's over. There's a song that we sing, when the battle's over, we shall what? Wear a crown. And that's not a song about a husband who's endured marriage or a wife who's endured marriage. But stop and think about it for a moment. I was thinking today, everything that has a beginning has an end. Ball game has a beginning, it has an end. Book has a beginning, it has an end. Everything that has a beginning has an end. This world had a beginning. About 6,000, no more than 10,000 years ago, when God said, in the beginning. And it's going to have an end. It's going to have an end, and it's going to end with you and I being harpazioed. Now, don't misunderstand what I just said. Don't hear me saying being harpooned or something like that. I didn't say that. I just imagine a little somebody saying, somebody's going to hit me with a harp or something. No, we're going to be caught up. 
The Lord's going to catch us up. And we're going to ever be with our Lord. No more death, no more dying, no more struggle. Aren't you glad the end is coming and we've already won? Amen? Father, thank you so much for your word, for your truth. Thank you, Father, for what you say to us in the pages of Scripture. Now, Father, may we be mindful that you're going to catch us up. You're going to clean us up. You're going to cheer us up. Someday we're going to be with you for all of eternity. We're going to be given assignments, some five cities, some ten, because you've not made us to sit. You've not made us to be lazy. But we'll have bodies that will have the ability to enjoy you to its maximum, and we'll love every minute of what we do. Thank you, Father, for the revelation, for your keeping power over our lives. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus we pray. Amen.